Welcome to the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum, our free Sunday lecture for October 2024. I'm so glad you all came today. Um, we want to thank our sponsors of this event. There are three of them, M&T Bank, North Country Federal Credit Union, and AARP of Vermont. And the, the museum's closing for the season really soon, so I don't have a whole lot of future events that are going to happen, but there's one. On Friday, we're having our first ever spooky story time. I'm going to be telling scary stories in the Ethan Allen house by the, by the fireplace. We have limited seating, because you know how small that house is. We have limited seating, so you have to buy your tickets in advance. Go to ethanallenhomestead.org and look at the online store there and buy your, buy your tickets now, because we have limited seating and they're selling out fast. All right, and if you'd like to know more information about Homestead Happenings, we have a printout there on the table there with the free literature. You can take one of them, one of them home with you. All right, some of you may have heard and seen news stories on the television about how we were robbed last Monday. Monday night, somebody broke in through the preschool and robbed the museum. They broke open our donation box. We had a beautiful handmade donation box in the shape of Ethan Allen's house with a little slot in the front. They threw it on the ground and broke it into pieces and took all the money out. We lost about $500 in cash and some electronics. So we're trying to recover for that. Now a lot of you have put, made a donation as you were coming in, so you're good. But if you didn't, and you're gonna eat some of our maple cookies, which are delicious, you know, put a little, put a little extra in there. Just for the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum, we've had, some, we've had some bad luck, and we would appreciate it. We're also trying to fix up Ethan Allen's house, which, uh, you know, have sustained some water damage. And uh, so that's a costly project. All right, let me introduce our introducer, who's gonna introduce the speaker. Her name is Maida Townsend. And she's uh, a relatively new member of the, um, of the board of directors at the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. And I don't know too much about her, but I learned and she told me. She's been, uh, for, for over 40 years, she was a teacher with Vermont, prep, uh, from Vermont Public Schools. She taught French. For 10 years, she was a state legislature representing South Burlington in the Vermont House. And she's currently an active volunteer for a number of organizations which I'm not going to list all of them, but Agewell is one, Vermont Refugee Resettlement Organization is another, and our favorite, which is the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. So let me introduce you to Maida Townsend. Thank you, well done, yes? So, we will hear today about the Battle of Cedar Creek. We will hear today about the Battle of Cedar Creek. Is this best? You don't have to get that close. Don't have to get that close. Right here? Okay. Okay. And that battle took place October 19th, 1864. So we're just one day past. At that battle site in Virginia, as you can see right here, there stands proudly and prominently one of our Vermont historical marker signs. And you can also see right here, and I've been there twice, I've seen with these own two eyes, it's still looking absolutely just as beautiful as it did the day it was unveiled in the Cedar Creek Room at the Vermont State House. And our speaker today will help us understand the link, the importance of this battle at this field, why it merits this marker in Virginia. He will help us understand the link between the Virginia battle and our Vermont history. Our speaker is Mike Sewells. He's a retired Vermont teacher. Several of you know him, I think. And he was not a teacher of history. However, in 2015, he moved down to Civil War territory. He moved down south to, uh, was it North Carolina? Yes. North Carolina and Virginia. And he became, he became enthralled by the Civil War history. And he immersed himself in its study, and he even served for two years as a docent at the battleground site in Virginia. That's all I'm gonna say. He will take us the whole rest of the way. And it's an incredibly moving 
and important story, which he is going to relate to us. So thank you for being here. Okay. I'm not sure about incredible moving, but that's okay. <laughs> we'll tell you when you're done. Yeah. I've heard that before. Uh, you know, it's exciting that just standing here, and, and there's a gentleman here, Tim, and his great, great, great grandfather fought for Vermont 8th. And what's fascinating with the Civil War, it's amazing how many folks that you run into that has ancestry related. It's just really cool because Vermont 8th, uh, there's a monument, we'll talk about that, very important part of this battle. And Tim, uh, thanks for sharing that, and that's, that's, that's really cool, that's really neat. Okay, welcome to the Cedar Creek presentation. Welcome to Ethan Allen Homestead. This place is beautiful. Uh, I've been on a tour here. It's along the river. If you're here or if you're watching, uh, you need to come down here. You need to take a tour. Check out the Abnaki uh, Gardens. Check out Ethan Allen Homestead. And check out the New Hampshire Grants. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Tom Sharpley and Angie Grove, director here, for helping me. Um, also, um, John Devino for helping me to make this thing uh, come about. Cedar Creek, what is this battle about? You know, what is it about? You know, Bruce Canton's written a ton of books in the Civil War. This book was written probably in 1960. How many pages are dedicated to Cedar Creek? You're right, one. <laughs> <laughs> Why? What? You've got to be kidding me. What about this place? Um, as, as you heard, I, I moved to the Carolina for a while. Uh, I know everything about Fort Fisher and the Civil War down there. That was kind of cool. But then we moved to the Shenandoah Valley. The Shenandoah Valley was quite an interesting place. You know, high school in Essex, I read one book. Um, now I'm reading two books every week for the last five years. I'm just fascinated with this kind of history. Five years ago, I had no idea where the Battle Creek was a place where they made cereal. I had no idea what it was. <laughs> so this battle, just when I was, did tours here, I learned about the connection. It was just incredible that I was on the very grass, looking at the very mountains and the river, and as, as a lot of soldiers, perhaps 40,000 fought. But I got my start here at the um, Bell Grove Plantation. You have to go here. You, you might get the Mike Sos discount if you're really nice. But I've got some um, brochures here about the place. This is where the Battle of Cedar C Creek occurred, OK? And at this place, I, I was a tour. I went on a tour, listened to this gentleman, a uh, gentleman by the name of Guy Young. He was fascinating. What he knew and what I did not know just <laughs> turned me on. So I, I asked the director, Karen Lace, there at the, at the Battle of Cedar Creek, and I started reading everything. And the folks, the soldiers that would come in, the, the people that came on tours, people like Tim, uh, a gentleman, uh, Stephen Ramser, who passed away as a Confederate general. I spent an hour and a half in the room where he died. People were asking me, like, where was his head? Where was his feet? What was he looking at? I mean, these people were just fascinated. I'm like, wow, this is pretty amazing stuff. So this place got me started. I started to uh, learn a lot about this, was a docent there for a couple of years, um, and it really helped me out. Also in the Shenandoah Valley, just for what it's worth, um, there's a thousand battlefields. I mean, you're kidding me. And you go on these tours with these authors, and you're learning about how they're all kind of connected. And I think 75% of the battles occurred within 50 miles of our house. I mean, how great is that? I'm a guy that used to train, do marathons, World Cup skiing, all this other stuff. Man, this stuff's much more important to me than, and I dropped everything. I just started reading, and people were like, Mike, what is the matter with you? <laughs> you know? At Bell Grove, Dr. William Selfridge was another gentleman who connected the Battle of Cedar Creek with Bell Grove. A, a walking encyclopedia, you know, I just learned so much from him. I don't know if, if somebody, I went to the National Conference at the Civil War in Stanton, Virginia last year. Last, uh, last year. There are a lot of people who know a lot of stuff, I'll tell you that. This gentleman, Scott Patch, and I met him a number of times. I don't know if you're familiar with him in the Civil War. He, he knows about every battle um, in, the, in the Shadow Valley. If you're a descendant, I don't care if you're Virginia 13th, North Carolina 8th, he knows where that battle, where you were, what time of day, probably what you were eating, and he would, that would be his first question, every battlefield. That was his first, who is his sentence? Amazing gentleman, but he, he's quite, a, quite an author. Again, 
one page, 1960, a whole book, okay? And there are many people like him. Uh, also, uh, Addis Walker, he's from Middlebury, wrote a book about the Civil War, the, the Vermont Brigade, which was Regiment 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 11. He wrote about that. He wrote right after the battle, 1869. Incredible story from his point of view. He was a member of the 11th. Jonathan Noyles, uh, he, he takes diaries of soldiers and integrates that into the Battle of Cedar Creek. A, a incredibly knowledgeable person. He also has Fisher Hill and a number of other uh, um, uh, battles, but another author who I really admired. And this person here, Howard Coffin. Well, first of all, Howard Coffin got to hold his book high because I look up to him all the time. This gentleman here is incredible. Uh, there's nobody more passionate, enthusiastic, knowledgeable about Vermont's connection with the Civil War. Also, for those of you that are old, um, excuse me, um, across the fence? Yes. Yeah. Okay, how many times have you seen him on across the fence? Oh, and he's certainly not talking about the fence. Um, but he's a remarkable author, uh, incredible. Uh, I mean, he knows, I mean, like I say, I kind of look up to him. Also, when, when you go to the Capitol, you know, there's a Cedar Creek room. It's kind of funny, because when I was a docent there, it's like, did you know in Vermont they had the Cedar Creek room? Uh, really? Uh, yes, I did. But Thomas, Sh uh, Dick, or Thomas David Schultz, a uh, great guy there at the, at the Capitol, he, um, I just brought this because, the, the Battle of Cedar Creek, the portrait of the Battle of Cedar Creek, People walk by there, and when I was there with, with David, he just had me hang out there all day, and I was giving tours or answered questions. But that battle, Cedar Creek, it's in the state capitol. I mean, it must be pretty important. And the gentleman that uh, did the portrait, Julius um, uh, Scott, he's from Johnson. I said, I gotta go find his house. Mm -hmm. So if you go on Route 15 towards Johnson, there's a blue house on the left, and there's a plaque there like that, and uh, there's some guys working on the house, you know, doing song and whatever they do. And I said, wow, this is really an important house here. And he didn't have a clue about anything. <laughs> so, so I shared with him that who this gentleman was. By the way, he was part of the Vermont Regiment 3. He was 15 years of age going into the battle. He was a fifer. And you listen to uh, you know, music. Uh, music. Uh, music was a, a big form of communication. And when I was at Fort Ticonderoga a few weeks ago, this woman was dressed in yellow. I said, Interesting yellow for it. She goes, that way people can see me because I gotta talk to people through my music. So the Pfeiffer was important. He was also a Medal of Honor uh, recipient in the, in the Civil War at Lee's Mills, down at Warwick, um, where we brought people across. So he's quite a distinguished person. Vermont 8th, okay, if I can do this without knocking anything over. That's the Bell Grove Mansion. Folks, every one of my tours started right there. Every tour. I get goosebumps because there's so much happened there. So much happened right there, you know? And I would welcome people, and there are bullet holes, cannonball strike here, bullet holes up there. Uh, we did talk about enslavement. There were 284 enslaved folks there, and Jefferson had a big influence on building this. This was built by the Heights. I don't know if you ever heard, well, you have James Madison, James Madison's sister, Nellie, uh, built this place, and so we were very connected with Madison, Jefferson, and Adams. Um, incredible manor house, but that was part of the tours. The Battle of Cedar Creek was part of it. Um, so it tended to, uh, and it, again, right there. Is that on the ground? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Many people call the Battle of Cedar Creek the Battle of Bell Grove. And there's the, the, the picture. Now, one way of describing that picture, folks, is these are ordinary people doing extraordinary kinds of things. If you can see the portraits and the faces, you can tell this Battle of Cedar Creek, it's a battle. Every one of these folks have a mom or a dad or brother or sister. Everyone's attached to somebody. It's not, this isn't a glorified like, oh, you know, two to one, we're winning. It's, it's a serious thing that happened, that people dedicated their lives to this. And this, this picture, when you go to Cedar Creek, or if you go down to Bell Grove, um, it really captures the essence of this as, as a, quite a battle. People are putting their lives in the line. Vermont 8th. Vermont 8th, uh, who's familiar with Vermont 8th? Just curiosity. Wow. Okay, thank you. Vermont 8th, in, 
I am not a military gentleman. Um, I did a, had a hiking club, and one of my friends was a colonel in the army, and he would hike like, like this, right? You know, <laughs> and so I learned through him that the army is actually organized. Thank you for your service. The army is actually organized. Uh, not that I didn't think. They're like regiments, and we talked about the regiment uh, eighth. They're like brigades, okay? And then there are divisions, and then there's corps, and then there's the army. So they have it organized so that if something happens, next one steps up. They know, they know what's going on. So the Vermont 8th was a regiment, all right? The 8th had three other um, uh, regiments with it. It was New York 160, Connecticut 12, and Pennsylvania 47. It's funny, I can just say that and you would believe me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Google it, I, I know this. And the 8th went in. And the 8th, I'll talk about the 8th a little bit later. Incredible monument. I used to work out somewhat. This was on top of the hill, so I would see it sometimes about 20 times a day. Um, but it was, it was pretty interesting. Jeffords uh, was part of getting that there. And also, Howard Coffin, when he used to go see that, it wasn't on National Park territory. So he had to buy maple syrup, give it to the owner of the house, say, can I go in your backyard and, and look at that? And, and that's the way that actually worked. Uh, also. So where is that monument? It's in Middletown, Virginia. And if, you, and if you go to Cedar Creek, if you go to Bell Grove, it's across Route 11. I'll talk about that in just a little bit. It's just a five minute walk from Route 11 uh, on the state park. Another person here, my wife's great great grandfather fought for Vermont Calvary under George Custard in, at the same battle. And we know that because it says it on the back of his picture. So again, here I am. My wife's family, I'm on the grass, I see the mountains, I see the river, I see the road, and that's exactly what he saw. Another picture of Bell Grove. Uh, I'm not getting money from Bell Grove for this, just to say, but uh, just beautiful. You look at Addison County, you take Lake Champlain out of the picture, put the Adirondacks, put the Green Mountains there, put the Otter, Otter Creek there, put Snake Mountain um, Range, that's that. You know, it's a beautiful, absolutely, I say to myself when I'm there, I'm like, look what I'm doing. This is so great, you know? And people, the Civil War folks come in and like, where do they, they come here, they go to Antietam next, Harpers Ferry, Gettysburg, Bull Run, go back home. That's, that was the common thread, people, yeah, we're going to Antietam, yep, yeah, Antietam is quite a place. 28,000 in 12 hours, pretty amazing. Uh, but I was, this, we won't talk about them, yet. But also for Vermont's connection, there were 21 medals of honor, and five of them went to Vermonters, okay, which is pretty exciting. Uh, William Wells, just to say quickly, he was part of the Calvary. His pictures, statues in Battery Park, yeah. born in Lake, uh, uh, Cemetery in, in Lake, Lakeview, where he's passed. I think he was the president of every single company in Burlington back in the, he was with St. Paul's Church, Champlain Transportation Gas and Lake Company. Uh, quite a gentleman who fought with Custer, who was a Medal of Honor uh, in Gettysburg. Right. Shenandoah Valley, this is part of it. Uh, very interesting, I thought the authors of books down south, they don't know directions. I mean, they're not really that smart. And all of these authors of all these books, I read, they talk about going up the valley and down the valley. If I'm going to the Northeast Kingdom, folks, I'm going up. I'm not going down. <laughs> well, in the South, it's the other way. I realize it was me and not the authors. Um, when you go up valley, you're going south. And that's because Shenandoah River runs from south to north. So I had to get used to that because I thought the soldiers were always going the wrong way. Like, what are you going that way for? You should be going the other way. Um, but I realized it was, it was actually me. Um, in the Shenandoah Valley, from this porch right here, right here, the porch, I like the other picture just because it, I like it. The porch, can, you're looking south. You're looking south. The Blue Ridge Mountains are over here. Uh, Washington, Richmond, okay, Blue Ridge. A couple gaps with the railroads going through Lynchburg, Nassau's Gap, um, a couple other gaps. And then you have the Alleghenies here with West Virginia. All right. In the middle, you have the Shenandoah River, which I have paddleboard hundreds of times, up not the whole river. It goes all the way up to Harpers Ferry to the Potomac. Right. You have the Valley Pike. 
The Valley Pike is Route 11, which follows kind of 81, and that was a macadamized road. Great for moving troops and great for moving supplies. Back in the 1770s when this was built, it was very important to get supplies in and out. The Shenandoah Valley, you had what, Harpert's Ferry way up here. Down south, you had Lexington, Stanton, about 170 miles south. That comprised of the Shenandoah Valley. The Shenandoah Valley was not a major theater war for, I got this at Bell Grove. Um, it wasn't a major theater. In 62, Jackson was down there. Jackson ran circles around the Union Army, okay, down at Port Republican, Cross Keys in, in, in uh, 62. And that's about all that really kind of happened there. In 63, Lee used the Valley Pike to get to Gettysburg. They didn't know the battle was going to be in Gettysburg. It's just 10 roads met there, and that's where they, they had it. Lee, on 63, coming back, he had to go through the um, Valley Pike. The Valley Pike was a, was a toll road. That meant people had to pay to keep to maintain it. So the question that you would ask, of course, is would Robert E. Lee stop to pay tolls for 40,000 soldiers? <laughs> Obviously, he had easy pass, and they just kept going through, OK? But, but Lee used that as an escape man place. The, the Shenandoah Valley was a diversion. See, much of the war happened to the east, in Richmond, um, Washington, uh, Washington. It was a diversion. What they did is they sent Stonewall out there with 10, 15,000 troops. The Union put 40,000 out there because they couldn't figure out what he was doing. But it took 40,000 away from Petersburg and Richmond. 40,000, 15,000 for Stonewall. If you look at the Shenandoah Valley, it runs uh, you know, southwest. So it, it's a good tactic for the Confederates to come up because it's at the back door of DC, which I'll talk about in a little bit. It goes away from Richmond. So the Union's always afraid that the, Union, the, the Confederates would come up and attack. So they had to watch out or come around behind. So it was a diversionary attack that the, the Confederates used very well, and the Union just couldn't feel, figure it out. I mean, Shields couldn't figure out. Fremont, who knows where he went. Hunter, he didn't know what he was doing. Siegel, he didn't know what he was doing. I mean, it, it was until Sheridan came that actually something happened in Shenandoah Valley. So that was 62. In 64, things started to happen. And 64, you had a new market battle, May 64. You had um, Siegel, Francis Siegel, he didn't bring the rest of his troops. And Breckenbridge, Breckenbridge, a little story about him, he's Kentuckian, okay, I'll tell you a little bit about him, a little bit. He won the battle down, in, the Confederates won the battle in New Market. So the North is saying, wait a minute, Bull Run, 60 days, it should be over, right? Because they had picnics, right? They had picnics down there to watch the battle, right? The first battle? Hey, uh, little did they know. The North was sick of the battle. They were losing so many soldiers, so many more than the Confederates, so many. And Lincoln was up for re-election, right? So this became, Lincoln was saying, we got to win somewhere. You know, we won it at, at to Vicksburg. We won it at Gettysburg. We won it. And, but the North is saying, we got to get out of it. We're, we're losing way too many. I mean, Vermont had, what, 37 soldiers and 6,000, one-sixth of the army passed away. Pretty amazing stat. So uh, Siegel goes to Bell Grove, front steps right here. And uh, Grant says, you know what, you're done. Hunter walks up the steps and says, see you later. So Hunter gangs up with Crook. Crook's not a crook. It's his name. Okay, so that happened. The Crooks happened on this day in St. Albans the day of the Battle of Cedar Creek. Those, Cedar Creek, those were crooks that robbed the banks. This is not what we're talking about. Some people confuse the St. Albans raid with this, but it's very different. But it happened the same day. Same. Three o'clock in the afternoon, three banks. That's the way it goes. Uh, so Hunter, Hunter becomes in, in charge. He goes down to Piedmont, Virginia, small battle wins, wins, goes down to Lynchburg. Lynchburg was a travel hub for the Confederate Army. Remember, the Shenandoah Valley was a breadbasket. How did Lee's troops eat? They ate from the Shenandoah Valley. What did Thomas Jeff Jackson say? Jackson said, Virginia goes, Shenandoah, Shenandoah Valley goes, Virginia's gone. So the Shenandoah Valley was really important for the Confederate soldier. He goes down, Jubal Early, Jubal Anderson Early. Um, I, get, I throw these names around, but 
uh, he was part of um, Lee down in Petersburg, and he sends a, a third of his army, the Second Corps, up to the Shenandoah Valley, and they wipe out Hunter. What does Hunter do in his brilliance? The Union commanders were like, they weren't, they were like, it could have been me probably. They didn't know what they were doing. Hunter and Crook, where did they go from Lynchburg? They went over the Alleghenies to West Virginia. Who is in the Shenandoah Valley? Nobody. Jubal Early says, you know what? Whew. What did Lee tell me? Wipe the Union Army out and take over, not take over Washington, get close to Washington. So he comes up to Monocacy. And he has a battle with Lew Wallace, who was the author of Ben-Hur. Ben and, and, and he wins the battle there. It's hot, it's hot. And people are dropping with heat stroke right and left. Grant says, what, what is going on? How, how can this happen? He sends the 6th Corps and the 19th Corps up to Washington. The Washington soldiers are all green soldiers. They, they have guns, but they don't know what to do with them. So he comes up with the 6th Corps, and they push, repulse, Jubal Early out of Washington at Fort Stevens. He moves out towards uh, Cool Springs. Been to the battleground a hundred times. My wife and I walk there all the time. It's great. It's a great thing. Plaques all over the place. It's on the Shenandoah River, and that's where Thoburn got caught on an island. And the uh, Union didn't use their cavalry. Cavalry eyes and ears. They didn't use them, so they didn't know they were there. <laughs> the Confederate Army was like, "Boy, they took, they moved them back," uh, but they kept going. They kept going, and. Uh, Jubilory goes down to um, uh, Kernstown. This is July. He wins a big battle at Kernstown, Battle 2. Kernstown, again, five miles from our house. Winchester changed hands 72 times, six miles from our house. Um, I, I went to these museums, like, like they all knew me after a while. So, hey, Mike. But it, it, it was amazing what happened. So, what happens after that? Well, Hunter, I forgot to say, the Battle of Newmarket, who fought in that battle? Somebody's never fought in a battle. The Vermont, VMI, Vermont, Virginia Military Institute, the kids from the classroom came out in that battle. All right? Hunter didn't like that. Hunter wasn't well liked in, in the Shadow Valley, believe me. He burnt down part of that, burnt down the governor's home, John Letcher, in Virginia. So now you have John Chamberlain. Chamberlain. You have, you have uh, let's, give, give me a thought. McCoslin, excuse me, McCoslin burned down Chambersburg. Just got it mixed up a little bit. He burns down, in, in late July, he burns down Chambersburg. Grant is saying, Lincoln's saying, wait, we lost at Kernstown. We lost at Newmarket. Herbley's on the corner, on the back store of, of uh, Washington. We got somebody burning a, a Pennsylvania city down, $500,000 ransom. You'd think the North would take the money, right? Um, but all of a sudden, we got a major problem. So Grant, it's August now, and he decides to do what? There's four armies in the Shenandoah Valley. The, uh, the Army of Susquehanna, the Army of Middle, the Army of West, and the Army of Washington. He moves into one army called the Middle Army, and Sheridan takes charge of that. Sheridan is, you know, get early out, waste all of Shenandoah Valley. We don't want anybody in there. Direct orders. Okay, direct orders. And uh, Sheridan's a fighter. I mean, Sheridan's a fighter. He, he's young, he's 33, but he's a fighter. He's proven it. And they think he can do it. Jubal Early, uh, much older, but Jubal Early had a sense of humor. He could swear, he was called my old man by uh, Lee, Lee. He could swear at Lee, but John Breckenbridge says, hey, uh, Jubal, in Virginia, there's so many first families in, Jim, in, in Virginia. What, what's, what's this idea? So he says, uh, well, uh, Breckenbridge, he's vice president. Uh, he says, all the second families, they all went to Kentucky. Bad joke. All right, so. <laughs> They're burning. Am I, I'm probably talking way too much. Uh, third battle of Winchester, all right? Third battle of Winchester. This is a true story. I, sometimes I go on with stories. This is a true story. What happened here was an amazing thing, according to Jonathan Noels. And, and I've done a lot of research in this, too. He, Grant says, I am coming to see you, Sheridan. You are doing nothing. You've got to do something. So Grant, uh, Sheridan, and Crook, 19th Corps, uh, 
they said, what are we going to do to try to do something? They know this Quaker lady, 20 years old, Wright. Is anybody familiar with Wright and Law, Thomas Law? Pretty interesting story. He says, we've got to get her to get information about Jubal Early's army. We want to know how many, where are they, and any resources they have. Sheridan has no idea. Crook has no idea. So Crook's army knows this gentleman, this enslaved individual, Thomas Law. And they, they get him. They ask him the questions. They write on a piece of paper these questions, put it in a pillbox, and he puts it in his mouth. So that when we ask him, he can swallow it. All right? He's, he says, you, we need to find out the answer to these questions. Well, right was the Quakers. Oh, we don't hurt people. We don't have that stuff. But it, her, her mother said, yes, you need to help out. So she, two days prior to this, there's a Confederate soldier who is being taken care of, sees Rebecca Wright, who's in her garden. She's 20, and she's 20, just to say she was 20. And he goes to talk to her, the soldier, about the Confederate. He tells her everything. He tells her everything. We, this wasn't prompt or anything. So, so Grant, he's really ticked off. <laughs> If my boss came to me and said, hey, meet you at 2 o'clock and said nothing else, I'd be So Sharon's concerned. Sharon knew everything. Grant came, and he said, uh, and he wouldn't let Grant talk. Sheridan said everything, and, and Sheridan said, Grant said, I want you to go in. Go in. And they won the battle, the third battle of Winchester. Imagine this. Imagine 7,000 cavalry members attacking you from across the field. 7,000. So they didn't have a chance. Okay? Two days later, I went down to Fisher Hill. Been there 100 times, too. Whew. I could talk forever about that Fisher Hill. <laughs> Same thing happened. Jubal Early was, um, was up on Fisher Hill. They, they, they flanked him. And who were the soldiers that went up the hill? The West Virginians, who are the mountaineers. Mm. Okay. Oh, thank you. Uh, it wasn't cut, it means you talk too much. But, but the thing was, they went up and flanked him. That was over. What does Sheridan do after the Battle of F Fisher Hill? He pushes Jubal Early down to Lexington, Waynesboro. Pushes. Burns the whole valley. 90 miles. Burns every farm, every mill, all the animals in the fall. Burns it all. Grant said, you've got to get this war over with. Didn't if you will, didn't kill people, sort of. But that's what he did. That's the burning. Sheridan couldn't go back to Virginia for about 30 years. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> uh, Hunter would never step back in Virginia again. Uh, by the way, Jubal Early and Lee, both of them, both of them did not want to succeed from the Union. But when Virginia went, they both went. But interesting. So, so now they burn the valley. OK. They go back to Cedar Creek. Cedar Creek, uh, Bell Grove. Bell Grove is the, the headquarters for the Union Army. Why? Why? It's a beautiful place. No. This is Bell Grove. This is Cedar Creek. These are bluffs. This is a great position to be in, because your uh, defense has to come across the river and then up a hill to get there. That was Fremont's, Seagulls, Hunters, Sheridan, Hope. Hope was there. That was their headquarters. Again, I'm on that very ground where that really happened. See you later. Oh, man, it just touches me. So, so, so the union is saying, the union's like, you know what? This battle is absolutely over. There's no, the, you, do you think Jubal Early's army, do you think they're coming north? No way. Yes way. Um, they come up 14,000 14, soldiers. The Union has 30, 30, 30, 32,000. In the beginning, 40,000 soldiers for the Union. 14,000 Jubal Early. The Confederates always fought with much less numbers. Always. And for Jubal Early, to attack this place with 13, 14,000 soldiers, 31, and to go up, cross, they crossed the river two times, North Fork, two times at night. 
They had three columns hack, attacking at the same time. Never happened in any Civil War battle ever except Chancellorville. Absolutely, and that was Stonewall, and he was late. Absolutely amazing what happened. Here's the Union. Here's the uh, 114th, uh, somebody in New Hampshire or whatever. He says, the confidence that permeated the majority of the rank and file of the Army of Shenandoah, which is the Union. On the night of October 18th, probably no army turned into its blankets uh, with more perfect feeling of security than which possessed Sheridan's troops on the night of the 18th. There was perfect confidence that Early had been gloriously whipped. I gotta move on because I, I gotta get to the battle. But, but, but <laughs> they knew it. They were sleeping in their tents, riding home, we'll be home, da 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 da. Well, I'll make it really quick now. Jubal Ray climbs up on single knob. Here's single knob. Been, been, sing, been there a hundred times. Um, that's Jedi, Jediah Hotchkiss, a Stonewall Jackson's cartographer, map maker, and J.B. Gordon and Evans up there with a few other brigades, and they're scouting Cedar Creek, Bell Grove. They can see troops, they can see cannons, they can see roads, they can see numbers, they can see flags. Jubilee says, we are going to attack. It's like, you've you, you got to be kidding me. We can't attack. You've got to be kidding me. They go up, they say, okay, this, you are the, uh, let's see, I'm going to share a little valley. Okay, I'm at the Bell Grove here. You have the right side of the Union Army is up in the air, Army term. It means everything's, you can see them coming, so not going to attack there. William Payne, cavalry general from the Confederate, he's going to go to Sheridan. He's at Bell Grove. Huh, he's not there. Um, Gordon says we're going to take 7,000 troops to flank this side. 7,000. They do it at night. 7,000 here, 4,000 scattered here. They attack at the same time, 4.30 in the morning. The Union can't believe it. They are, you just, there's nobody would do that to us. So Rosner is either a cavalry guy, he and Custer are great friends. He takes some prisoners from Vermont 4th and Vermont 11th over here on the, on the right side, and he quits. And Custer's like, huh, I'm quitting. He's this, this girl, um, who's a, a spurs into, uh, he caused havoc there to make everybody go over there. The knife, the uh, uh, J.B. Gordons, uh, Pegram, and Ramser all over here, they attack the flank. They're getting crushed. 600 Union members and Thoburn's brigade are gone within 20 minutes. They're crushed. And they're running to the Corps 19th. Here's Corps 8, West Virginia's Corps 19. Uh, the 6th Corps is behind the manor. Kind of get. So these uh, Union members are running to Middleton. Sheridan found some 15 miles north still running. They were crushed. Then, Vermont 8th. Wasn't Sheridan away and he was just arriving? Sheridan was coming back from Washington. Yeah. Sheridan was, was staying in Winchester. Uh, Sheridan had no idea because uh, Horatio Wright was in charge at that time. Horatio Wright thought, there's nothing going on. He was, by the way, he's a little connected to uh, um, Northfield to uh, Norwich. But he didn't think anything of it. Horatio Wright said, there's nothing going on. There were many soldiers in the Union Army that said something is too quiet and something is going to happen. Now, Early did put some cannon into Bell Grove. 200 soldiers died. That was three days before. Um, but they still thought nothing was going to happen. So I'll get to Sharon in a few moments. So now you've got Core 8 moving, Core 19 saying, what's going on? It's, uh, it's um, uh, fog. Nobody can see anybody. Everybody's shooting everywhere. And they run into the Core 19. Brick top, old brick top, General Emery, 19th Corps. He says to Stephen Thomas, brigade leader of the 8th, says, I want you to go in there. I know I'll never see you again. You go in. So he went in. Did I, sh the Vermont 8th? Sorry guys for doing this. I keep you, keep you guessing, that's all. So there's the Vermont 8th. The Vermont 8th went in and lost three quarters of their soldiers within no time. They were getting hammered by Stonewall Jackson's old division. They, they, they just got totally annihilated. A thousand soldiers went in, Vermont 8th, Pennsylvania, New York, um, and Connecticut, they went into a buzzsaw. And, and Emory knew it. Why did they do that? They did that to slow up the Confederate onslaught. It was intense. So, so that happens. 
The eighth comes back. That, flat, that monument has four sides, one smooth, three rough. Three rough because one side says three quarters of their men died. They got attacked in three sides. And flag bearers were very important in the Civil War. If you go to the state capitol, you're not allowed to, except I am, maybe you are. Uh, we're allowed to go down to the basement and see those flags. Pretty amazing. You get a chance to go see those flags. Um, three of the, the flag bearers were mortally, mortally wounded also. It's right up on a hill there. Uh, has anybody seen that monument? Well, you got to go down. You, you see it? Yeah. It's, it's just, it's just, it, it's really kind of frightening to see that. Uh, but that's what happens. Okay, let's move on because this story, this story still goes. Um, the sixth corps starts to come in. Oh, thank God we had sixth corps. Oh, uh, Mount Brigade, whatever. Um, the, the Confederates keep going, and the sixth corps goes up onto a cemetery hill. All right, and up on Cemetery Hill, there's, by the way, there's an auto tour there. It does all this. It's beautiful. You just drive around. Um, they hold the Confederate uh, charge. They have one uh, approach to this, uh, the Cemetery Hill. It's the repulse, twice repulse. They throw cannons in. Finally, the Vermont Brigade moves back a little bit. What happens with the Vermont Brigade? What happens is pretty amazing. Um, they were up on that hill against all odds. Uh, uh, they were next to Bidwell, who is a New Yorker. <laughs> goes to the history of Ethan Allen, New Yorkers. Goes way back, folks. Um, and Bidwell gets mortally wounded. So French, uh, the army is organized. Uh, Colonel, General, Colonel, Lieutenant General. So all of a sudden, French comes up. And the soldier says, what do we do? And what does he say? Don't run until the Vermonters run. It's a famous saying in the Battle of Cedar Creek, okay? And so the Vermonters hang in there. They hang in there a little bit longer, and finally they're, they're repulsed. So you've got 40,000, almost probably oh, 6,000 died. You, you've got 35,000 Union troops in the morning running. Running to middle it's north. And you get the Confederates going, you know, let's, we're, we got them on the run. This is really important. Jewel early, like all this kind of stuff's going on. So who comes riding? The motivator, the motivator guy, here he is. Now, yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. So the Confederates move, they get to a point, Jubal Early and Jamie Gordon here, and they say, the Confederates say, let's, let's stop. We've done really well. Let's call this a victory and go home. The Union soldiers thought the same thing. The Union high command thought the same thing. Everybody thought they're going back. If that battle would have stopped then, and it could have, um, it would have been an amazing kind of thing that ha would have happened. This is them discussing this. Jubal Early says, we're done. One of the main reasons, folks, is the Union, the Confederate Army, they didn't have shoes. They didn't have all night. They're tired. They're hungry. Where did they, what did they go through to get there? All the Union tents, all the food, shoes, blankets. A lot of them, a lot, not all, big argument, big argument, um, down south for sure, um, that they were, they were using all the, putting on shoes, eating food and all that stuff, and they were tired. But what was another major reason? Sheridan has 8,000 cavalry members that are, haven't even hit the battle yet. You got Custer way out here with Vermont 1, you got Merritt way out here, they weren't even in the battle yet. And Jubilee really like, huh, they're coming around behind us. So they have a big, it's called the halt, for those of you that would like to lead, learn about the controversy. It was, it was very controversial. Forty years later, before J.B. Gordon passed away, he blamed him early. Early had been dead ten years. Uh, anyway, uh, so a lot of discussion about it. So that was a turning point. Sheridan comes down, puts his ear in the thing, and he says, we've got to do something about this. Sheridan unbelievably motivates these soldiers. The soldiers are running. He says, don't do this for me, do this for your country. And he turns them all around. Amos Tracy says, Vermont, uh, and you know what I'm talking about. He says, uh, he says, men, who are you? We're the Vermont Brigade. Okay, we'll be in our tents tonight for dinner. And Sheridan rides up and down in front with his horse and his flag. Rianzi, Rianzi, people thought he's dead, the horse dead. The poem about him is about the dog, about the, 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 the horse certainly isn't about him. He runs back and forth and he's, he aligns his troops. He gets them all organized. Horatio Wright and, and Crook, his buddy, they thought they were going to Wilson and call it a day. We're, we're, we've lost everything. 24 cannon, we've lost 1,000 prisons, da, 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 da. He turns them all around. 
He rides up and down. The soldiers are going, he's back, he's back. The Union, the, the Confederates are like, wow, they must have more soldiers. Something's going on here. And no, it was, um, how much more time? 15? Oh, so what was going on was, no. Uh, a, a remarkable turnaround and a remarkable controversy. If you go to YouTube and, and oh, I forgot to give Eric Campbell. Eric Campbell's the chief interpreter for Cedar Creek for 15 years. At Gettysburg, Eric and I, 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 you know, folks, you know, I had time to talk to the, like the, the Pete Roses. I had time to talk to people that know everything. And if you go to YouTube and go to Eric Campbell and Battle of Cedar Creek, amazing knowledge this gentleman has. So, so the Union is kind of resetting. The, 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 uh, um, the Confederates are like, they're not sure. They do attack the Vermont Brigade over near Middleton. They do attack. Uh, it's, it's, it's a little skirmish, if you will. The Union's not really organized. This is 4 o'clock in the afternoon. This battle started at 4.30. Uh, they're a little bit uh, getting organized. Um, Ramser, um, he's trying to uh, cause some commotion, but they can't do anything. Um, on this right side here, you have Custer over here. Evans is playing in, in the woods over here. And, and the 19th Corps didn't see them. And they blew up the 19th Corps. 19th Corps starts running. Custer comes through and he clears them out. He's got 3,000 people on horses, folks, with the best guns in the world. The Confederates have no horses. If they get to go to a barn and say, hey, turn away your horse, honest God, that's what it was like. The Union had everything. They had everything. And so uh, they, they moved out. And unfortunately, um, over here on this side of Middletown, Ramser, youngest general, the Confederate Army. Well, these are all West Point guys, by the way. They're all, he, he, youngest general, has a daughter. Hasn't seen his daughter. Has a little white pin on his, on his uh, jacket uh, to, to see his daughter. And he thought after, uh, uh, he thought after um, Cool Springs, he would be able to go see his daughter down in North Carolina. Well, that doesn't happen. He gets mortally wounded in, in Middletown. So, the Confederates now, again, AM, uh, Union, PM, totally the other way. The, the Confederate Army is running. They're on the run. And uh, the, the 7,000 cavalry members are just running them down. Over the, over the Cedar Creek, there's a bridge, and it gets tied up with wagons and all that kind of stuff. And uh, Fred Lyon and, and Sweeney, they're both, um, they're both uh, Vermonters. Uh, they both got a Medal of Honor for this, and they captured Ramser in a wagon. And they said, who's, you know, who's in this? They captured General. They brought him to, they brought him right here, folks, right here. They brought him up the stairs. Um, to the right is the library, first room. They put him there, and, and, and he died there. Now, he's a Confederate general. Uh, he is real good friends with Merritt, the cavalry custard, uh, Sheridan, uh, DuPont, Henry DuPont, very good friends. So here they are fighting, 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 fighting. At the end of the day, the Union command is trying to save his life. And he, unfortunately, he, he doesn't make it. But, you know, in that very room right here, in the library there, that's where, you know, his last uh, gasp of air was towards Henry DuPont and said, tell my daughter, you know, that, that I miss her. And in 1920, they had a, um, uh, the uh, uh, Daughters of Confederacy, they put up a monument right in front of Bell Grove here. It's a, it's a long column. It's got cannonballs on top signifying Ramser because of his dedication to the Confederate Army. He... Uh, and then his daughter Mary, Mary was there at that dedication, which is pretty kind of cool. Uh, cool, I can say it's cool. But uh, and Henry Dupont, along with many Union generals, uh, spoke of the brilliance of this gentleman, Stephen Dots Ramser from uh, North Carolina. So you know, in the battles, uh, it's too bad that it doesn't happen beforehand, not afterhand. But that actually did occur, and it did actually occur inside uh, this building right here. Uh, so that was kind of, kind of. I'm going to ask questions. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up right now. <laughs>
Uh, I gave a speech for my uh, daughter who got married two weeks ago, a five minute speech at Jay Peak, and I told him that Jay Peak was uh, named after John Jay because in 1787 uh, he was the first Chief Justice assigned by George Washington. And that, got, that didn't go too well with people, but it didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but little did I know my three brothers on, had bets on how much time it would take. <laughs> and 18 minutes, and unfortunately, my daughter said we had to pay the DJ longer because you spoke to him long, we had to pay him much half an hour. So that's what you get when you do things like that. All I gotta say is a couple things. That what would have happened if Jubal Early turned and the you know, uh, Union was found to Winchester? What would have happened? What would have happened for Lincoln's election? Of course, you gotta remember, Sherman's down in Atlanta causing problems. He was not marching to the sea at this time, so you had that battle there. So would Lincoln have won the election? Because that probably not, but it might have been, it made a difference. So what, what would have happened if Sheridan was in the battle in the beginning? He was in Washington, was standing, because they were saying, Sheridan was saying, hey, we're done here in Shenandoah Valley. Where do you want us? You want us in Petersburg? Where do you want us? And Jubal Early was like, oh, no, no, we're, we're not done. Um, so what would have happened? And last thing to say is uh, what Sheridan said in Montpelier years later. What did he say? Better late than early. <laughs> okay, hey, thank you. Thank you very much. Questions, questions. Any questions? Um, okay, um, now, yes, I'm sorry. Can you speak a little bit more to how they were all at West Point together? And, yeah. Or which ones were at West Point together? Yeah. By the way, Norwich had about uh, 21. Or and, Norwich. And Norwich had four Confederate generals, believe it or okay. not. Um, uh -huh. Confederates, the West Point was the largest uh, mm -hmm. military. Um, they all went, Custer got, if you had 100 demerits, you're out. Custer got 99 every year. <laughs> yeah. uh, Custer was, a man, and, and Drew Early wasn't too far behind. Um, uh, almost all the major generals were from West Point. Lee was, Longstreet was his best friend. Longstreet, he, he was at Grant's, now they're fighting against each other. He was, he was best man at Grant's wedding. Right, wow. and they were just amazing. Yeah, yeah. And Long, so Longstreet, you know, so the more you learn, there. You know, all the graduates. So if you look at Jubal Early, I, I have it somewhere, but um, the number of union generals that he went to school with is amazing. Yeah. So, so personality played into this a little bit. Yeah. Even Jackson went there. He went to be a minor. So, it, you know, and, and then um, Annapolis had a few, and Citadel had a few, but mostly West Pointers. But, but Custer was, uh, uh, he, he was, he was a fighter. And one famous general, very famous general, finished last in his class at West Point. Uh, who? Pickett. Grant. Oh, oh, Pickett. oh, Pickett's Charge. <laughs> well, let me tell you something about Gettysburg, about Pickett's Charge, just a quick story. Um, um, there is a buffet restaurant in, in Gettysburg. And if you listen to, uh, there's some great historians on uh, Gettysburg that are on YouTube. There's one gentleman I really, really like. He says, you know, we're at Gettysburg. He says, you know, if you go to Pickett's for lunch, charge it. But yeah, Pickett, I, I, did, I did not know that. Last in his life. But there, yeah, yeah. Well, some, I mean, some people you know, didn't finish very high. Sheridan didn't, uh, but. Yeah. Well, all their classes, were in Latin. Well, well, yeah. The other thing is, if you look at the West Point curriculum, which I have back then, it was not a war school at all. It was an engineering school. And then when battles came out about the Battle of 1812 stuff, they started saying, hey, maybe there's something to this. So it was originally not a war, uh, a battle school. It was, if you look at the curriculum, Ranter's curriculum, which we've looked at in that room when we had all day with those people, um, I looked at the classes that they took, and some of it was on artillery, but most of it could have been French, could have been, you know. Well, the, la the courses themselves were in a different language. That probably wasn't so the that if general. you were, if you came in at the bottom of your class, it's still probably not such a bad thing. <laughs> because all the, they were, I mean, this was America. How many, yeah. like, yeah. it was an old school European idea yeah. of how, Classwork yeah. should be presented. 
So, yeah, but what I read was <coughs> yeah. Custer really was a badass. Michael? Yes. Who was Westport founded? When? Uh -huh. Thomas Jefferson? Uh, what was the question again? Question, uh, Jefferson found a war school or, or college. Of course, you got to remember, Jefferson was the smartest person in the world besides Ben Franklin. You know, and Jefferson put that together. And I think just after 18, uh, what was it, 18, 3, 18, 14. I don't have my phone to check it out. Oh, don't Google me. Oh, wait till later. This <laughs> <laughs> now Google says, Alexa, when did whatever? Any other questions? A great battle. Ask me another question because I'm here and I don't cost that much. So just, just. I mean, uh, there must be another question about Custer or not, or Sheridan or Bell Grove, how you would like to go down here to the battle of Cedar Creek. These people are remarkable people. Um, Okay, another question, please. Yes. Thank you. Where was, what, what is the point where the painter was standing to paint the Oh, oh, wow. great question. Almost everybody thinks it was at the gate. Oh, mine, it was nowhere near there. It was at Cemetery Hill. If you look at it, which um, I'm not going to take too much time, there's a mountain here, which is mass enough mountain. Yeah. And that's what gives it away. Uh, but yeah, that's, it's Cemetery Hill. Uh, you know, you, I know you could see Massanutten, but yes. it's... And, and Massanutten uh, is, a, is a range right in the center, and Signal Mountain is about 1,800 feet higher, so I've been there a number of times to see scope. It's really a beautiful place. What a place to, to see all this, uh, the northern part of Shenandoah Valley. Yeah. But yeah, that was Cemetery Hill, and you can see, if you look closely at that picture, um, and I'm not sure... Uh, if you look closely, there is a big boulder on the ground in the front of the picture, and it's split in half, and there's a cannonball there. And according to David uh, Sheets, David told me that he thinks that um, Scott put that there purposely about how divided the nation was. I don't know if that's for truth. I know, I know the cannonball's there. So if you look closely at that, right in the front, yeah. And, and Tim, did I answer any questions? Do you have any more questions about the eighth? I mean, this, this is exciting to have yeah. somebody here that... Yeah, I mean, just, it, it, I, it, it said he was in the, vol the eight volunteers, company F, but I, there was something else on the bottom of that stone that I unburied when I found it, mm -hmm. but it's been sent covered up. Mm -hmm. I've forgotten just what that was, but... And, and Tim talks about the companies. So you had your regiments, and then you had companies below that. So companies made up the regiment. And regiments were about 1,000. During the end of the battle, they were about 400. And about, in this battle here, about 6,000 casualties Union and about 3,000 casualties Confederates. In almost every battle, we lost, we don't say that down south. Uh, but down south, the, um, we lost half the battle, half the soldiers in almost every battle. But they lost a larger percentage. And that's, that was a, that was a, Appomattox happened. What happened after all these soldiers were here? Uh, well, Jubal really lost his command. Lee says, you know, sorry, you should have won. What's the matter with you? So he went down Waynesboro, had a thousand troops or so, and the rest, uh, J.B. Gordon took the whole second corps, went down to uh, Appomattox, and uh, actually the Vermont Brigade stayed in the Santa Valley through March, and then in April they came over to Appomattox, and so that's where they all came back. And then Sheridan, because of his horse, was the hero. Every Vermont Northern school had to recite uh, Reed's poem. Uh, uh, it was pretty interesting, because it's about the horse. And uh, then his horse's name was changed to Winchester after a while, and then people claimed that they saw his horse, or, or they didn't see his horse. His horse was dead, and I mean, it was all sorts of stories, and a lot of insurance companies back in the 1800s used that picture of Sheridan writing for brochures for their uh, for selling insurance um, so he got a lot of uh, a lot of where you know and he said he didn't deserve the credit that he was given because he wasn't there <laughs> but but he turned the whole you know I don't know if you ever meet somebody that motivates you like crazy uh, sometimes Jerry motivates me a little bit he scares me a little bit but you know when you get motivated you know you like you see Sheridan you know, Okay, let's go. You know, let's go. We can do this. And the Vermonters played such an important part of this battle. Um, I've heard there were more regiments here than any other battle, including Gettysburg, which the other Vermont brigade was at Gettysburg. This brigade was not. Um, so, you know, it's an amazing thing 
amazing battle to Vermonters. And I honestly knew nothing about this the day I took a tour there. I knew nothing about it. And this is Middletown, Virginia, which is 10 miles south of Winchester. That's where this, this place is. And I would encourage, oh man, it, it, learn about the history of the United States. The sign that was also in the background in, that, in the, the same area, it said it was the last battle of the, of the valley or? Yes, valley. It was the last battle in the Shenandoah Valley. So I, I have, this is my f husband's great grandfather who was from Milton, Vermont, and he was in the second regiment, Vermont, Company H, and this is this is a history of all the battles. He was in quite a few different ones, um, and one of them was yep, Cold, Cedar, Creek. Cedar Creek, Cold Water, Cold Creek, Cold Harbor, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. and um, so I have you know the picture of him. Yeah. I also have a Foot Locker with these items in it. I don't know what to do with it. But. You know what? <laughs> do me a favor. Bring it to the Essex Historical Site, and we'll take a look at it. Wow. Seriously, oh. I, I volunteer there with Jerry oh, and Jan. I live in Essex. Are you Judy? <laughs> What's that? Are you Judy? No. I thought I told you for us. Hey, the, the, the Vermont Second was oh. mustered in Burlington, Vermont. Okay. And if you go to Battery Park, you'll see Vermont mm -hmm. Second right, right there. Mm -hmm. right. Um, and they took companies from all different um, towns in this area. Yeah. Vermont 2nd was the first regiment in the Vermont Brigade. Okay. And they were one of the first regiments for over like a three month term. I think there were nine months or something like that. So the Vermont 2nd played an important role in many battles. The Vermont Brigade lost more soldiers than any brigade in the Civil War. The Vermont Brigade was different than every brigade except for Wisconsin, I think maybe one in Michigan, that they had all of the regiments in the Vermont Brigade. And there was an argument about that. Why would you do that? Because if you lose out, you've lost your whole town, everybody in the community. So let's have different states represent the brigade. Like Thomas's brigade had New Jersey, Connecticut, New York, Pennsylvania, Vermont. So what the Vermont brigade did was very interesting. They were not going to allow them to do that. So we don't want every regiment from the same state. And Vermont, other than Michigan, per capita had more soldiers civil war than any other state. And when and 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 Howard Coffin's book here is full full duty. That comes from Erastus Fairbanks, who was the governor at that time. And when Lincoln asked for that number, uh, uh, Erastus Fairbanks says, we will, Vermont will do its full duty. And not only Vermont gave a half a million dollars, Stephen Thomas, who was born in, in Bethel, who was buried in Montpelier, um, he donated another large portion of money so more soldiers could go to the battles, uh, the battles, to go to the battles to go to, uh, into the Civil War. Many of these folks were down in Louisiana, the Vermont 8th, they, they were down there most of the time. It's remarkable what this state did in its contribution to, uh, to the C Civil War in numbers. And I don't know all the generals from Vermont. But we'll look them up, and we oh. must say thank you so much. <laughs> thank, thank you. Hey, that was a lot of fun. You're all, uh, thank you.